Hi everyone, welcome to today's podcast. Uh, today we actually have a very special guest. Uh, we have Matt Boyd, who is the co-owner of Healthy Baller, where I'm actually fortunate enough to work. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Matt for about two and a half years now, um, and I think a lot of what I've learned with working with athletes can be attributed to Matt. Just the time that I was able to spend with him and just picking his brain and watching his sessions with athletes and stuff. Uh, he's taught me a lot about movements, how to talk to athletes, what an athlete needs to go through in college. And one of the biggest things Matt has taught me personally is the fact that he, we need to put our athletes first. And I think Matt is living proof of that every single day that he's in here. And uh, a lot of the late stage movement stuff, stuff that you guys see from my social media, uh, as far as the, the reactive cutting, using the balls and all that kind of stuff, is stuff that I've been able to learn from Matt. Uh, so welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate uh, being here. Excited about it. Awesome. And Matt, do you mind just kind of sharing us a little bit about your story and maybe how you started Healthy Baller and everything like that? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty cool story. Uh, I think just because Blair O'Donovan, the other co-owner, and I have a, have a great relationship, um, and it started back in high school. I went to school um, at a public school in, in Rockville, Maryland called Magruder High School. Uh, basketball and baseball were my, my two main sports. And my junior year, we were introduced to a company called Eats and two of their trainers, uh, Blair Donovan and Alan Stein. Um, they would come and work with us once a week. Um, they seemed like great guys. They motivated us a ton. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I realized this is, this is a pretty cool gig. You know, they're coming out and they're taking us through, you know, plyometrics, they're taking us through speed, speed work, et cetera, and then they would play pickup with us afterwards. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm looking at these guys thinking, this is a really cool job. And, and at the time, uh, being an athlete, you know, kind of is, is how I define myself. Um, and, I, and I did get into strength and conditioning when I was in eighth, ninth grade, um, just starting to pay attention to taking care of my body and things like that. Um, and, but those two guys really lit a fire for me. And then my senior year of high school, I ended up interning with Blair and Allen, um, as well as Jason Hadid. And, and these are three really big names in our area. Um, and I learned a ton. They were working with uh, a lot of the type of athletes we work with now. So a lot of lacrosse, basketball, soccer, football. Um, and, and they were kind of the dominant force in this area. Um, so I ended up getting a certification my senior year uh, per their recommendation and carried that through college. I uh, majored in exercise science at GW. I um, was fortunate enough to play baseball there and kind of observe firsthand what a college strength conditioning program looks like. Um, but all the while stayed in touch with Blair um, and, and Alan as well and kind of continued to build that relationship, train athletes in the, in the um, downtime, you know, winter break, summer break, things like that. Um, and out of college, I ended up working with um, Explosive Performance based out of Sport and Health and working for Kevin Boyle, who is um, a phenomenal mentor, um, you know, from the education side, but also from the, uh, the business side. And so I worked in Bethesda, building my part of the business there um, and, you know, continuing to learn and, and had a couple great mentorships. Um, and about four years later, Blair reached out and said he had been building his business and, you know, he and I had, had stayed in touch again this entire time and stayed close friends and, you know, said, hey, let's let's try to do something special. Um, and, uh, you know, now we're here, so. And do you mind telling me a little bit about, I know not, not many people know exactly how much you work and just all the things that you kind of have your hands in. Do you mind just because I think that at the end of the day, you're not just a business owner for as far as Healthy Baller, you're also a coach um, and everything like that. So do you mind sharing the other commitments that you have outside of specifically being an owner of Healthy Baller? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think if if my role was limited to just management and administration, uh, administrative, you know, um, items, uh, I would be miserable. Um, and that's not to say that those things don't have their place. But, uh, you know, to be honest, both Blair and myself got in this because we love working with athletes and we love um, you know, being able to, to be a piece of the puzzle to, you know, help them reach their goals. And so for me, uh, my current roles, um, strength conditioning coach for the Bishop Arts and girls lacrosse team, um, strength and conditioning coach for Gonzaga men's lacrosse team. I also work with capital girls lacrosse year round. Um, and then, 
you know, I have a, a handful of athletes that I'm working with on a on a daily basis. Um, we have a huge college program um, at Healthy Baller, and so overseeing that as well. And that's mostly uh, we, from our female side. We have a lot of female lacrosse, soccer, um, and field hockey players that train in the off seasons with us. Um, and we are in the process of, of building the same thing for men's. So awesome. So needless to say, Matt is an extremely busy man. Uh, so I'm definitely very thankful to be able to pull him aside for you know 45 minutes to uh, get him on this podcast. And as far as healthy baller goes, Matt, do you did you imagine that it would be where it is today with this many strength coaches and also having three PTs with you now? Did you feel like this is was this part of your vision when you and Blair first started this? You know, five years ago at this point. That's a tough question. I think um, you know. At the, at the time, Blair and I just wanted to create something special. Um, and that was really directed toward our athletes. And, you know, we, we love the kids, the adults, the, the parents, everyone that supports us and, and works with us. And I think we wanted to find more people that shared our vision, um, you know, and I don't think we ever imagined that we would have the group surrounding us that we do. And I think that, um, you know, I've been in the industry a while and he's been in the industry even longer than myself. And I've never been around a group that is this passionate, driven, um, and embraces kind of the culture that we had always imagined. Um, and so I'm grateful every single day to walk into this place and be excited, you know, and it could be a, 12 to 14 hour day with a lot of the administrative roles that I don't like. Um, but I come in here and I see a session with one of our strength coaches or I see a, um, you know, a, a session with, with you or Teddy or Alyssa, one of the athletes recovering from an injury and uh, it's incredible. And I think that, that we are incredibly lucky to have a culture that we have here, which is, um, you know, family like, um, and you know, making this a place where everyone here wants to get better and wants to learn from each other um, and wants to see each other kind of be successful. So uh, I think we had a vision to help as many athletes as we could. We just didn't know um, where that would take us and we didn't know how many great people we would meet along the way that would share that vision and want to kind of push forward in lots of different directions. So. Yeah, and I'm sure that when, when Teddy came to you guys a few years ago, to, to, he was like, I, can I set up a table in the back? And you guys were like, maybe it was it was weird. You know, it's, it's not something you guys were used to your first two or three years of being in business because you guys focused mainly on strength and conditioning. Um, but I think that you kind of were like, okay, maybe, maybe maybe that could work. And obviously now it's a big part of Healthy Baller. And at least for me, I'm very thankful that you allowed it to happen because I wouldn't be here if you guys didn't allow Teddy to set up that table in the back. And even on Teddy's episode, we talked about how when I first came into Shadow, he was literally a table 10 feet away yeah. from the squat rack and you know inches away from someone deadlifting or squatting right behind him. Um, but obviously now we have an office and everything like that. So it's definitely cool to see how far, even from the two and a half years that I've been here, how much Healthy Baller has changed and grown. And at least for me, I'm, I'm excited to see where we're gonna continue to grow. Well, I think, I think uh, to your point there, you know, I remember the first time we had a, a sit down and got coffee with Teddy. And, you know, when he first started in here, he was he was a performance coach as well. You know, he was training a couple of baseball groups and, and you're right, he was operating in a, in a you know, on a table in the back of the um, of the back of the facility. And I think the growth of the physical therapy side is, is completely because of him, yourself uh, and now Alyssa. And I think that it's it's. Not anyone could have come here and done that, right? And I think that you guys are incredibly special and again, you know, share the passion, um, you know, that we all have here, but more importantly, understand that everything stems from the relationship that you have with your athletes or your patients. Um, and, you know, you're building relationships that will last forever. And I think that anyone who walks in here and, and watches a session that you have with one of your patients knows that there is a very strong bond there and that is why this, you know, has grown the way it has. And I think that's something that we could have never foreseen, um, but are incredibly excited about where it's going and, and, you know, grateful, so. Yeah, and I think that's definitely one of the biggest things I learned about working with athletes coming here was, you know, when, when an athlete walks in the door, you like, you hype them up. When Wes 
hypes up his athletes. He just yells their name from across the yeah. gym, and they they love that stuff. And I think it's just, and we we go to their games and all that kind of stuff. I, at my last job, I would have never thought to go to any of my athletes' games. It was kind of just like see you later type of thing. And here we are building, like you said, long lasting relationships. Stuff that you know, even now, a lot of my ACL kids I work with for months, I still and still keep in touch with them. Just being like house school and things like that, and go, still going to the games. And at the end of the day, it's not something that we have to do, but it's feels it's something that we enjoy doing because we love helping these athletes just get better, get stronger, and get healthier, all that kind of stuff. And I just think that uh, because of what you and Blair were able to start five years ago at this point, uh, it's it's I think it's something that's invaluable, and hopefully other gyms across the across the U.S. and things like that are are able to continue to build. Um, and I I, I kind of want to ask you a question about you personally. And you know, obviously, being a physical a physical therapist, I'm I'm interested about your injury history because I didn't know you at the time. But do you mind sharing about your injury history, uh, particularly at baseball at GW? I know you had a lot of things going on, and well, and is there anything that you would have changed or which would have been done better? Um, yeah, this is this is uh, where do I start here with with the injury history? Um, you know, I was injured more than I was healthy, so that that's not ideal. Um, yeah, I think it, it shaped the way I, I view strength conditioning. It shaped the way that I view, um, you know, uh, understanding mobility and, and how and its place in, in range of motion and different exercises. But basically, um, you know, my sophomore year, I had a high femur in, in, in my left eye, which is a crazy injury. Uh, basically, was doing a soft toss exercise to a teammate and literally the tennis ball went through the net. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's cool that I, I have, I didn't shut my eye, like I'm tough, I didn't shut my eye, but if I would've just shut my eye, I would've had a black eye. Instead, I had a high femur. Um, so I was seeing yellow, um, the tennis ball for a little while. Um, so that set me back a month or two just because um, I couldn't do a lot of movement for a while. Um, my junior year, I broke the hook of my hamate bone in my left hand, which is a common racket um, or bat um, or club injury. Um, and then my senior year, I had bursitis and a bone spur um, in my, my right shoulder, and that ended up um, being the end of my career. So, you know, the last one was, was definitely the most frustrating, um, and I think that it was most frustrating because I did everything the right way. Um, you know, I took care of my body, I went to every lift, I did all the extra work, I did all the recovery work, um, and, you know, I was doing an overhead barbell press with way too much weight, um, and especially being a baseball player, I never had shoulder pain in my life, and, you know, I didn't have the best range of motion, so I'm finishing, you know, uh, with the weight over my head, and the coach asked me to pull, pull my arms back a little bit more to, to get to a position I should have been in, but obviously my range of motion limited me, and I felt a pop, and uh, the next day I went to throw at practice, and I felt a stabbing feeling in the back of my shoulder and um, you know basically my rehab process was not was was the worst it could have been um, the diagnosis was that it was just minor and rehab for a little bit and you'll be back and that was the fall of my senior year um, I ended up having a rehab for five months um, still never got to throw without pain so I finally got a cortisone shot which worked for three days um, back in pain and at that point it was the season and so surgery would have taken me out for the entire season. Um, so I just told the coach, hey, like, this is my senior year. You know, I, I'm going to play and play through it. Um, and I ended up making a, you know, a long throw in, at UVA of all places. And, and um, I ended up, you know, not being able to lift my arm afterwards. And, and I couldn't sleep. And so I had to surgery immediately after and, you know, watched from the sideline, didn't get to travel part of my senior year. And, and you know, all my teammates are, are finishing their season um, together. And so that was a, honestly the, the lowest point of my, you know, probably my life in general because I define myself as an athlete. And so um, for me, I think this really added perspective to what I do now. And I think a huge part of what we do is supporting our athletes. And that whether you're a performance coach or whether you're a physical therapist, um, you know, the psyche of an athlete is delicate. Uh, especially when you're you define yourself as an athlete and now so much of what you do every single day whether it's practice whether it's strength training whether it's skill work is now removed from your life 
um, your social network is removed. Um, you know, your identity is, is kind of in a state of crisis. And I think that um, going through that time really changed the way that I see athletes recovering, dealing with an injury and recovering from it, um, and allowed me to speak better to people in that situation and understand that, listen, you can come back and you can be better than you were before. Um, you can get through this. It's okay to lean on people. It's good to talk to people about what you're feeling and how hard this is. Um, you know, and surround yourself with people that are going to help you get through this process because it is hard. And when all you know in your life is playing a sport and that's taken away from you, like that's a, that's a shock to the system. Um, so yeah, I was pretty bitter. Um, and it took me a little while to, to kind of, you know, um, kind of let that dissipate, but it was a huge learning process for me and it definitely shapes, um, again, the way I have some of these discussions or um, just the way I view things because, I, you know, at the end of the day, I think performance coaches, the, the primary evaluation of how well you do your job should not be, you know, um, did you get them faster? Did you get them stronger? It's, are they making it through the season healthy? And then, you know, did you get them faster? Did you get them stronger? Um, because a lot of people, I feel like, end up chasing numbers. Um, and, you know, I think even uh, just that's a shift in the, the kind of way that everyone is training. I think now that you'll see across the board a lot of uh, the performance coaches feel the same way that, that I do and that you do. Um, but that, that's taken some time to evolve. And so for me, that's what I'm thinking about is, especially with some of the teams I work with, you know, that's how I'm evaluating is, is are these athletes peaking at the right time? Um, and are they, they managing the volume of a season and a preseason and an off season um, while staying healthy? Um, and of course you can't prevent injuries, but trying to reduce the incidence is, is, uh, is paramount, so. Yeah, and I think load management has probably been one of the biggest things that Matt has imparted on me as far as the PT side of things and just understanding that you can't go hard five, six, seven days a week. You gotta make sure that the body needs rest. The body will typically let you know when you need to rest. And I think with what I've seen from you is that you are very structured in the way you do things. And you, I, I, I've even heard you yell an athlete, yell, quote unquote, yell, like take the day off tomorrow, don't do anything tomorrow because you see that they're maybe running a little bit slower than they're used to running because of your, your college prep program and stuff. And I think that it's, it's really cool that you are literally telling these athletes that sometimes you gotta take rest because I think you growing up as an athlete and me working with the athletes, it's a lot of times it's like, if you're not, they feel like if you're, not doing anything, that means that you are behind or you're not doing enough type of thing. But at the same time, rest is so important for the body, getting enough sleep. I think you talked to your athletes about sleep a lot, stress management. Uh, there's so many factors that go into managing an athlete and it's not just the amount of weight that you lift in a room. Uh, so I think that's definitely something you imparted on me. And uh, last summer, Matt and I started to team up for our late stage ACLs. I talk a lot about making sure you're networking with strength coaches because at the end of the day, as, as as PTs, we don't learn a lot that they have. And I think that that's a big part of why I try to incorporate uh, strength coaches because they have a skill set that we don't have. And it's no different than Matt not trying to do like the early post-op stuff. You know, we're, we're, we're a team at the end of the day. And Matt has put a lot of trust in me to treat his athletes because he sends a lot of his, especially his lacrosse girls because those are the ones he sees the most. Um, but at the same time, recognizing my limitations, especially in the very, very late stages, um, and Matt, as a strength coach, has a keen eye for kind of breaking down specific movements, teaching them to, teaching them for athletes and understand like, oh yeah, she's not loading that knee as well as she did prior. Because all these girls Matt worked with, you know, when they were in high school, so it's, it's stuff that he has seen them do and maybe they're running a little bit different. Um, and I think that it's, it takes a certain skill set to be able to do that. And I have not developed that yet. And that's why we team up for these. And for a typical session, at least for us on those joint days, we try to, and we, I just talked about stress management. So for us, the, the system that we develop is if they're coming in three days a week, they're coming in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday and Thursday, they're off. We shut them down. They are, they're, we literally tell them that you're not supposed to do anything at home because they're still recovering. They're not at 100% speed yet. So making sure they're getting the rest days is important. So for us in a typical day, they'll do about 30 to 45 minutes of movement with Matt. That'll be acceleration, deceleration, uh, change of direction, reactive stuff, all that kind of stuff that, that he's really good with. And then for me, I focus another 45 minutes on heavy lifting. And that's the system that we developed for our lacrosse girls so far. I say lacrosse girls, the most ones that we've been working with. And we, we've been pretty successful so far. We had two return last season. We have 
four coming up this season. And un unfortunately, there is going to be more. Like you said, we cannot prevent injuries. But at the end of the day, if we can significantly reduce the likelihood of them tearing a second time, I'm going to be okay with that. Um, just because we understand there are injuries that come with sports. And uh, through the years, you've trained a lot of athletes, Matt. I know that every time, I can almost tell when you kind of walk to me and you have your phone in front of you or something like that, just the demeanor that you have when an athlete tells you that they tore their ACL. I can see on your face because you've worked and you've committed a lot of time with these athletes. It's, it's never easy for you to tell that to me because you understand that it's like they're going to be on the shelf for a while. Um, and I think that it's just that that just shows the relationship that you have developed. And when you put that trust in me, it makes me like I got to almost sense that I can't let the athlete down, but I also can't let Matt down because he's putting a lot of trust in me. And it's reflective of you as a strength coach, as a business owner and all that kind of stuff. And we know that research nowadays states that on average, uh, one in every four to five athletes are re-tearing. So that's 20 to 25% of athletes are re-tearing. And as a, as a strength coach, what do you think ACL rehab, and especially let's say the late stage, we'll say six months and after, should look like? And what have you learned through the years with working with uh, recovering athletes from ACL tears? Yeah, um, well, uh, I think the, the first thing that, that you hit on is, um, you know, the magnitude of the injury and, and the impact it has on um, you know, the coach and, and the relationship that you have with an athlete and, um, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's, um, it's definitely a hit in the gut and you end up retracing every, you know, all your steps and reevaluating, okay, all the programming I did over the last few years and, um, you know, going through it and checking on volume and checking on, you know, and I end up asking a hundred questions to every kid that ends up getting injured and, you know, if any of them are listening, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about asking all those questions, but you know, it, it, it's hard. And I think that, that, uh, you know, I understand, um, having gone through injuries myself that it, it's, it's a, it's a shock to the system, as I said before, and I know it's so much harder on them than it is on us as coaches, but you know, because of the relationship we build, we end up being along for the ride, you know, and, and we see them in, in the highs and we see them in the lows. And so we get to be there and, and cheer them on when they're they're on the field and have a really great moment or a great game or reach, you know, a level they haven't reached. But then, you know, if they experience an injury, then it's, you're just as down as, as they are. And, and it definitely, um, you know, I, I think if you're having athletes where it doesn't impact you, then that's probably a question. And, and you know, I, I've learned to control what I can control. Um, and that's that was hard, you know, because, um, and that's, that's advice that I would give to anyone who's working with um, athletes is, is focus on what you can control. And I think, you know, as people get injured, there's certain factors that are completely out of your control. And you have to understand that. Um, and then focus on the, the areas that you can influence and you can control and, and, and master those and do the best job you possibly can every single time you're seeing them. Um, but, but to your question about what it should look like, uh, you know, I think the most essential thing is to have a performance team in place. Um, and you know, we're incredibly fortunate that the two of us get to work together and you know, I know that I can focus on my strength and you can focus on your strength and we collaborate literally daily throughout the recovery process and we're speaking daily and it makes it so much easier that we are, you know, having these conversations being five feet away from each other instead of, you know, having to jump on a, on a phone call um, with another, you know, PT clinic or w whatever the case may be. Um, However, if that's the situation, then communication needs to be seamless um, between every coach that's involved, between you know the athlete and all the volume, like you mentioned, sleep and nutrition, um, excuse me, and, and how much that that um, plays a role in the recovery. But um, from a movement standpoint, um, from a performance coach standpoint, I think someone really needs to focus on um, you know helping the athletes master skills that. Uh, they are relearning, mm -hmm. and um, you alluded to change of direction, acceleration, deceleration. Um, you know, jumping, landing, pivoting. Um, you know, creating separation, uh, juke slash dodge, whatever you want to call it. These are skills that they knew their entire career. You know, and didn't have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and now 
there's a level of, of thinking going on when they're doing all of these. And so we know that if they're lacking confidence in these movements, they're gonna operate at a lower intensity, um, which actually puts them at a higher risk of getting injured. And so for us, we really need to create mastery and, and, and you know get them to a point where they feel and move proficiently in a lot of these different patterns. And so we start um, by focusing on one skill at a time and then continuing to add new constraints and add new variables um, and, and um, you know, end up adding different stimulus and things like that. So we progress the movement patterns and, and um, you know, add multiple movement patterns. And so I think that's where, you know, if anyone who's listening has seen some of the stuff you put out there, you'll see different drills where, you know, we're starting with the basic cut and then we're adding, you know, and now you're reacting to an opponent. Okay, now you're, you know, catching a pass with two steps to now react to an opponent. Um, you know, now you're dictating where the opponent's going, the opponent's dictating where you're going. Mm -hmm. It ends up being a chase drill, um, you know, and there's lots of different um, components and constraints that we can, can add and build on. But all of these are, are to kind of get them to go through most of the situations they're going to see in a game or a practice and uh, build their confidence. Um, you know, the confidence comes from learned success. So for them, they need to go through some of these situations um, and identify when they're struggling with figuring out a movement pattern and communicate that to us, and then we need to address it and do the best we can to, um, you know, to, to fix it if we can. And, and there's, certain, there's certain times where we kind of throw them into a situation and hope that they sort of auto-regulate and correct, but there's other times where we need to break a movement down because they feel like that's not their knee. Yeah. You know, and so it's not as easy as, okay, set your feet outside your body when you're changing directions. They're like, well, I don't like putting, loading this leg, yeah. you know, and that, that takes breaking it down step by step. How do we decelerate as we get into a change of direction, you know, position, and then how do we reaccelerate out of it? And then, you know, make it reactive and then make it add a skill so it's game-like and then add an opponent. And so um, I think that's, that's kind of how I see the later stage. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but from the psyche side, um, you know, it, you, you got to be able to communicate with your athletes because uh, and, and understand where they're, um, you know, confident in the recovery process or the rehab process and where they're lacking confidence and focus your time on that so you can help get them where they need to be um, and prepare them for, for the field. Yeah. And I think that the, I really emphasize the relationship portion and having a team behind it because I don't know if it's a, a pride thing or whatever it is, but I think that I could not get these athletes all the way back on my own. Um, a lot of it I've learned from Matt and Wes and other trainers here and things like that. And I even just last year, I was able to work with Wes for the basketball girl that we, we were able to get back, help get back to playing basketball again. And I just think that there needs to be more cohesiveness, I think is probably the best word for PT, strength coach, athlete, parent, coach. There's so many things that, that a team that needs to be put in place in order to get the athlete all the way back. And I think we started this last year, because I, I, I pretty much was like, I think, I think you need to help me with this. And I was just <laughs> like, and you, it was, I think it actually worked out even better because of the, specifically the girl that we had, because I knew she was very, very close to you and continues to be close to you. And I think that it was, you were like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely eager to help out and stuff. And I, the, the fact that once I saw that and just, you know, I'm always trying to figure out how I can better serve my athletes. And I believe you, I know you are the same way. And when we started doing that, I was like, this makes sense. And this is, totally works for us. And we've done it multiple times and we're, we, we're still doing it now. We just, we were just able to help a girl that we're going to our game on Saturday. And then last year, I think was really special for us because of the girl in particular, she played in the championship game. And it was just, I think for us being there, it was just such a cool experience to see from our first game back when we were like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know, a little nervous. Uh, it's, it's always nervous watching their first game back and we were there for her, one of her first games back. And it's just, it's a little scary to see, you know, even though we knew that she was strong enough and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's always a little nerve wracking. Um, but then just watching the progress that she made throughout the season and because she went to a school out of state, we weren't able to watch her as consistently as maybe we would have liked to, but just the, the night and day difference and being there for her. And, you know, I think that that stuff is invaluable. And to this day, I think she still really appreciates what we did for her 
and obviously we both care a lot about her, continue to care a lot about her, and we're still going to go to one of her games, at least a couple of her games this year. I think she would probably yell at us if we didn't go to her games. At least this a year. few. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't be one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that it's just such a cool thing to be a part of that. And I, and I, at least for me as a PT, I love being there with you because it's like we were, we, uh, we were a team helping her, the, whatever the athletes get back to their sport. And uh, I, I think that kind of trickles into the next question, but what advice do you have specifically for strength coaches? Because I know that I talk about a lot from the PT side of things, but for you as a strength coach, like what would you say the, some advice you have working with athletes uh, recovering from, from ACL? And maybe the relationship that is necessary to have with PTs as well. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that it, it needs to be, um, again, seamless communication between the athlete, the strength coach, the physical therapist, um, and, and you know, it, depending on how old the athlete is, probably the parents, um, you know, depending on how, how involved the parents are. If we're talking about a collegiate athlete, it's different, but, um, you know, you know there, I think there's a lot that can be lost um, when we talk about, okay, I had physical therapy yesterday, I'm doing a session with the strength coach today. If those two professionals are not speaking, um, <clears throat> we end up overloading the athlete. We end up um, not addressing the areas that the athlete really needs extra time, extra focus, and we're, we're overlapping. And I, say, I think that's the, the um, beauty of what we have together is that, you know, it's very clear cut. We both have come up with a plan. Um, we've evaluated the athlete and you're saying, okay, from a strength standpoint, um, from a loading standpoint, here's what I see that, you know, um, our athlete needs to work on. And then I, I would evaluate her and I say, okay, here's what, you know, for example, the girl worked last year, here's what she needs from a movement standpoint. Um, you know, and, and even if I don't, even if I had not worked with her in the past, you know, every time she comes in, I'm evaluating her movement patterns um, and identifying areas that, okay, well, you know what, she struggles getting into a crossover step or a crossover run. We need to go over that more. Mm -hmm. Or she struggles with linear transitions, um, you know, going from a back pedal to a sprint. We need to, you know, work on that more. And then I speak to you, hey, Doc, how can we end up loading? She's really struggling with back pedaling. Mm -hmm. like, you know, that, that's a tough movement, especially ACL. I think that's one of the, the movements that is uh, the most awkward in the, the recovery stages. Um, so even we talked a lot of times about uh, change of direction and, you know, depending on which leg is loading, we use that in a lot of your programming because we, we you know, we come back and look at um, one of our athletes who's struggling with it. So you adjust programming to, to load that um, position a little bit more. And so, um, you know, I think that again focusing on what you can control and owning that but then communicating to the other professional who's involved mm -hmm. so that um, you know you, at the end of it you can step back and say you know what I did as much as I can I know the other professional did as much as they can I feel like together we were a great you know performance team that collaborated on this recovery process and and um, you know unfortunately we've heard about so many situations where that doesn't happen yeah. um, and you know, yeah, it's an extra step for us, especially if we're not in the same building. You gotta send a long email that says, hey, here's how her session was yesterday. Yeah. Um, and in, in the past, you know, uh, before we had physical therapy here, that's what I had to do, you know? And, and um, some physical therapists just felt like that was too much work for them. And I'm sure some strength coaches would feel like that's too much work for them. Um, however, if that's how you feel, the recovery process is not going to be the way that it, it could potentially be for that athlete. And so um, I'm proud that, you know, I get to work with you and we can provide a unique um, recovery experience for our athletes and, and keep everything under one roof and keep everything as a collaborative effort between the two of us, um, you know, who, who focus a lot on honing in on our skills in certain areas. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's you trusting me with movement and me trusting you with loading. And, and being like, you know, let's, let's just work together yeah. to get these athletes where they need to be. And anytime there's an issue, we both know. Mm -hmm. It's not that, oh, okay, um, you know, she's really sore today. Oh, I didn't know that. No, like, I, Doc already told me mm -hmm. before you even came in. You know, and, and like those notes are shared on every single athlete. And, um, you know, that, that's the glue in the recovery process is, is the communication and, and the managing the volume and, and um, you know, and also the relationship. 
Yeah, and, and I think that the communication by far is the most important thing between the team, the rehab team that's in place. And even for example, you know, a girl who have maybe has trouble transitioning from a T-step and you let me know that, oh, she looks a little bit slower coming out of it. Maybe that's more of a strength thing at that point. And so I need to work on more like a lateral lunge type of thing. Or you let me know that she looks a little bit slower than what you did previously. Cause you've seen most of these girls that come into the door, you've seen uh, even from when they were high school or the, or the year before. So you understand like how fast they should be, how quick they should be. And if they're a little bit slower, maybe that's a strength thing or a power thing that I need to incorporate into my programming for, for these athletes to get them all the way back. And I think that that late stage component is by far the, the, the trickiest thing to handle. Uh, I think that a lot of facilities can get people back to that four or five month of jogging, maybe even running okay. But it's that really late stage stuff that we've been able to kind of like try to piece together that we're still continuing to try and piece together is what's helping these athletes get back to playing at 100%. And no matter what, recovering from an ACL tear, it, there's so much of a psychological component to it. So they understanding that we have their back, we are with them 100%. Um, I think that even for example, the girl that we're going to watch this, this Saturday, like she, it means the world to her. Like she texted you and I know you gave her a hard time about <laughs> saying that you weren't gonna be there. And I know she would have strangled you if you weren't gonna yeah. be weren't there. Uh, but th this stuff means a lot to them. They know that we have their back and that we're not, it's not just like a, rehab and done or training and done type of thing, we are with them. And she's gonna be with us for another two or three years when she continues training with you over the summer because she'll be back and she'll be healthy. Uh, so I think it's, it's at least for, for me, I just love being a part of the entire process from, from day one, getting them all the way back to the field, watching them crush it and score goals and, and things like that. It's, it's such a, I don't know, it's, it's so in, it's, I can't really put a price on it. You know, it's just, it's such a unique experience that I would have never been able to be a part of in a more traditional model of physical therapy because it was always four months, four or five months, and it's like, I don't know what to do with you now because the heaviest dumbbell we have is 10 pounds and I have no field space, <laughs> I can't do anything, you know? Um, so I, I, that's why I, I hope that anyone who's listening, whether you're a PT, strength coach, whatever it is, it, it's just a team. It's not, it's not a pride thing or anything like that. We all have our own specialties. And I think that if you find a strength coach on, on my end and a PT on Matt's end or strength coach, you know, that you trust and that you can develop a relationship with, it can be invaluable when it comes to the ACL rehab type of thing. And I think that, especially from the, the PT side, you know, just going out and networking, uh, it's it's not just gonna help you as a, as a PT, it's just gonna help you just better serve your patients. You know, it's like, oh wow, like they are going above and beyond. And it's not, again, it's not a pride thing. I understood my limitations at my last facility, which is why I refer them to Teddy. Teddy rehabbed them and then maybe they'll refer them to Matt. You know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a system that, that needs to be put in place. And I, I strongly encourage more PTs out there to do that. And I think Matt would encourage more strength coaches to do that, to have a relationship with PTs. And uh, hopefully you guys found some use in this episode. We're talking about the relationship that Matt and I have been able to develop. And we're gonna continue to develop this thing. And there's gonna, unfortunately there'll be more, more kids that come in through us who have ACL tears, but we're gonna do right by them and do the best we can to help them get all the way back. Um, any parting words, Matt, that you have for, for anybody listening, maybe from whether it's the business side of things or just the strength coach side of things? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, whether <clears throat> you're a strength coach or a physical therapist, um, you know, understanding, again, the, the impact that, that this injury that we're, we're referring to has on the athletes, um, and and what you can offer them, and I think for the athletes, yes, it's a it's a rough injury, it's a long um, recovery process, but this is also an opportunity for you to improve on inefficiencies in your movement patterns, improve on you know um, strength deficits that you didn't realize that you had, and you know our our first job is to assure that our athletes that they can come back being a better athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that the first comment that we hear from a lot of our athletes is, I'm not going to be as good as I was. And, um, you know, they don't realize that, that they haven't had access to a performance coach one-on-one -on -one for six months, you know, or, or for, you know, months five and, you know, five to 12. And they haven't had an athletic trainer or physical therapist who's working with them, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, in these scenarios. And they haven't had two people collaborating, um, you know, to focus on just their rehab and evaluating every movement pattern and every strength exercise 
from a programming standpoint, from a progression standpoint. Um, and so, you know, for the strength coaches and PTs, have a plan, mm -hmm. create a plan, unique, you know, uh, have your standards, but, but remember that you're dealing with a different athlete every single time. Every single session they come in is an evaluation. Evaluate um, their, how they're moving that day, how they're feeling, know when to push them, know when to pull back a little bit. Um, you know, that all goes into managing the training volume. And then for the athletes, use this as an opportunity. Um, you know, and something that I tell all of our athletes is it's all, it's about small victories. Mm -hmm. It's a long process. Um, it's easy to get down, but if you focus on one small victory at a time, you end up being a lot more positive. Um, and so, Hey, today I was able to walk without crutches or, or I even, even, you know, walk back a few steps. I had surgery. That is the, the first step in the recovery process. I'm walking without crutches. Another small victory. Okay, you know, I, I was able to jog. That's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was able to start doing movement. I was able to start cutting. I was start, able to start doing, um, you know, practice, not non-contact. Like those victories add up, and now you're setting, um, you know, you're, you're focusing on the on the behaviors and not necessarily the outcome. Um, and so, you know, I think that ends up uh, making it a little bit more digestible for the athletes and, and focusing on that instead of like, oh my gosh, I've got this many months until I'm back on the field. Um, so, you know, again, thanks, thanks for having me and, and it was a lot of fun and I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful to obviously speak with you, but also to collaborate with you, you know, on a daily basis because um, I've learned a ton and I also feel like we've got something special going. Um, so I'm yeah. excited to be a part of it. Definitely appreciate you saying that, man. And the same thing, I go back to you. And I think even just what you said, just to wrap up and celebrating the small victories is such a big, big part of ACR Rehab. Having gone through myself and even just all the athletes that we deal with. And I just think back to, even right now, you're not working with her yet, but the high school girl that we have right now, I know she was very close to you, her whole family, her literally whole family trains here. And uh, the fact that every single time she does something, she wants to run and tell you because of the relationship that she has with you. So I was like, I gotta go tell Matt. Matt, Matt, you gotta take a video of this. <laughs> and you step out of your office, doing your, your, sometimes you're doing admin work in your office, but you step outside, you watch her, and you celebrate her and the quote unquote small accomplishment. It's a big accomplishment for her because it's, it's months of rehab just to get to the point of jogging, and then more months of rehab to get to like sprinting and cutting and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's something I've grown to really appreciate from, from you as a trainer, even though in the early phase you're not technically a part of it, quote unquote, but you're still there because you care about these kids far beyond. Um, like just the, I guess the physically being able to see them or work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I know you would kill to work with her and, and it's, it's coming, it's coming because she's, she's getting better each week. Uh, but I think that's something that's really unique about you as a strength coach, as a business owner, all that kind of stuff because you care so much about every single one of these kids. And I, and I, I still remember the first time you, you presented someone to me that was, that was one of your, your close athletes that you were close with and she had an ACL tear and I think that when you came to me, I could just see in your expression because you almost were in disbelief. And again, it just shows how much you care and how empathetic you are towards every single one of your athletes that walked into the door. Um, and I just would encourage all of you guys, again, whether PT, strength coaches, ATs, whatever it is, just care for these kids because that's what they need, especially when you're dealing with ACL rehab. Um, so yeah, definitely appreciate you coming on, Matt. And do you mind just sharing a little bit about um, maybe the Instagram for Healthy Baller and then the website, so in case people want to find out more information about us? Yeah, so our Instagram is uh, healthy underscore baller. Um, and, you know, we like to post content that's a lot of movement work, it's some strength work, um, a lot of different coaches collaborating, so we try to keep it up to date. We're, um, you know, we're not at the uh, Wesley Wedding level, but... <laughs> Um, few are, so we're trying to grow that. Um, so if there's anything that anyone, you know, enjoys seeing more than other topics, definitely let us know. Um, and then website, uh, we have an incredible website, uh, designer, um, Alina, and she will be keeping that up to date. So, uh, we've got some new programs coming up this, um, spring and summer and we'll keep them on there. And then, um, I think we'll have some other coaches collaborating with a, a blog soon. So cool. And I'll put the, the links to the Instagram and also the website in our show notes in case you want to check it out. Uh, so thanks again for coming on Matt and hopefully you guys enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for watching today's video. Please feel free to like and subscribe and share it on your social media platforms. 
If you're interested, I have started an ACO Mastermind Group, which is a growing library of content centered around ACO Rehab. It has exercises ranging from immediate post-op to late stage sports specific movements and everything in between. It's a growing library and currently holds over 250 videos. There's content centered around assessments, movement breakdowns, exercise breakdowns, case studies, and a whole lot more. You also gain access to a private forum where you can engage with like-minded people, ask questions, share research articles, and share resources. If you're interested, please feel free to click the link below. Thank you for watching.